Thesis five, uh, democratic demands for the exercise of leadership. Okay. Now, we will situate ourselves decidedly at the level of political praxis, actually practicing theory, in the sphere of strategic action as such. And strategic action is when you coordinate with other people and decide on a plan of action, and, and then you try to carry it out. Politics can be described as having three levels. The level of normative principles, so he's going to call that C, like kind of like maybe the bottom level. And then there's the level of institutions, B on top of that, and of political action as an agonic activity, but distinct to war, A. I'm not sure if he, how he wants that. I don't know. I don't know why he's listing them in reverse order. Um, but notice he wants political action at the base level as something that's antagonistic, agonic, but not simply, uh, you know, conducting warfare at, at the drop of a hat. In this sense, Fidel Castro expressed himself in the following way, quote, we understand as people when we speak of fight, the great irredentist mass, the one that wishes great and wise transformations in all orders and which is decided to achieve them when it believes in something or someone, above all, when it believes sufficiently in itself. Okay. Um, so this is the self-consciousness of the people and then working for transformative action. The reflection is strategic political because it situates itself at the level of fight antagonism. In this agonic level, it is not only theory, it is not only theory is necessary, but also faith. Interesting. The belief as subjective conviction that allows itself to be opposed to the unjust state of rights. So you really got to believe in something and, and be willing to act on that belief and not be overly hesitant. You know, the people have to move forward. One must believe in the postulates, the kingdom of freedom, the dissolution of the state, the society without classes, etc., whatever it is that, that the people believe in at the time, but also in someone like Fidel Castro. The people can be convinced rationally of a political plan, but subjectively it must objectify someone in, the, in her honesty, integrity, courage, wisdom, in order to give her the mandate of taking charge of the responsibility of a shared attainment of the strategic goal agreed upon. A pact of mutual collaboration is established in a people that sufficiently believes in itself. And this is because in the fight, in war, instantaneous, difficult, and complex decisions must be made frequently. Karl von Clausewitz uh, describes this as follows. Okay, so here he's, he's, saying, he's saying there is a legitimate populism where there is a leader that people actually believe in and, and can lead the people without dominating them, okay, because the people nonetheless still believes in itself. Uh, Karl von Clausewitz, um, a political theorist, very famous political theorist, um, he describes this as follows. If we observe an ample form, the four components of the atmosphere in which a war develops, danger, physical e effort, incertitude, and chance, luck, it would be easy to comprehend that a great moral and mental force is necessary for his advance with the security and success in this disconcerting element. A force that historians and chronicle writers of military successes describe as energy, firmness, constancy, strength of spirit, and character in a leader. They can make quick decisions and lead uh, the people. In other words, and in Gramsci's words, let's say, uh, quote, Marx and Machiavelli, this argument can give way 
to a double task, a study of the relations between them as theoreticians of militant praxis and of action. So Gramsci and Dussel is suggesting here in Gramsci's words that you have to have a combination in the leader of Marx and Machiavelli. And I described Machiavelli um, and, uh, you know, he presents the prince as a ruthless um, power monster uh, as, as the advice to princes. Um, and it seems a little extreme, but what Dussel is saying is that you want some medium ground. You want somebody who has the intellect and analysis of somebody like Marx, but you don't just want theory, you want action. You want to put theory into practice. You want theory and praxis. And of course, Gutierrez and, and Romero talked a lot about this because they were concerned with similar issues. Um, and, and so you don't just want to talk about uh, democracy and populism in this case. You want somebody who can theorize and put it into action. And of course, uh, Fidel Castro in many ways was that kind of person. You know, he did have a lot of theoretical ideas, but he also was able to lead the Cuban people uh, very effectively. And he was popular. I mean, people did like him, uh, despite uh, the dictatorial, you know, authoritarianism uh, of his reign. Uh, by and large, he was a lot more popular than, than you might get the impression of from uh, the media in the United States. Because, of course, the, the media in the United States was, was um, projecting the Washington consensus and what Washington was trying to do throughout the, the presidency of Fidel Castro was to totally undermine the government. They were trying to assassinate Castro. There's several assassination attempts. They were blockading uh, the country so that it was difficult for it to uh, survive economically in the world, and that goes on even to this day. Um, so the economic troubles of Cuba are largely due to the economic blockade that the United States government places upon it. Um, and, uh, you know, so there was just this active uh, campaign to destroy Cuba, and the American uh, United States media just tends to go along with whatever the Washington consensus is in these situations because they don't want to offend people in power because the journalists depend on that inside information, uh, you know, and if they're not particularly concerned about Cuba, they'll just say whatever the, the Washington politicians want them to say. Um, so militant praxis and action, somehow getting the balance right again. This, tax, this task situated in a strategic level without theoretic intention is interested in giving birth to a political party that strives to found a state. Uh, that is the consensus project that Dussel was referred to earlier, to striving to found some new uh, political institution, the state. The organic intellectual who cannot be without charisma is con uh, conceived in the complex encounter of A, the party militant, B, the organizer as a political leader, and C, the one who has the capacity to formulate theoretically and organizationally the strategic steps in the short term, the tactical, and above all, in the long term, the properly strategic. So. Um, uh, there is a distinction between tactics and strategy. Strategy is your long-term objective. Tactics is how you're going to uh, operate within a, a more uh, well-defined short-term project. And so, for example, in, in, in like warfare, uh, a, the strategy may be to uh, outflank your enemy. Um, and, and, and therefore break their front. Um, generally, that's what you're trying to do. Okay, and, and maybe you're trying to outflank them, I mean, go around their, their, their uh, troop buildup. Uh, but tactically, uh, uh, 
tactically what you're doing is you're just fighting the enemy at every at every spot, right? And and tactics is just about okay, uh, just the guys on the ground know what to do in a particular situation and they carry out uh, the standard operating procedure. Uh, but strategically, a, a general could maybe have a particular military unit pull back, and rather than following normal tactical guidelines, they pull back and they they don't, and maybe you know sort of pretend like they're fighting, but they're in a in a strategic re retreat, and that strategy where you try to uh, manipulate the the larger situation through a strategic uh, perspective. Okay, so tactical is more short term and more day to day. Strategic is the long game. And so you need somebody who can do the short term day to day on the ground uh, organizing and leadership, but you also need somebody with a strategic vision. In general, Latin American political philosophy, which comments on the European and North American authors, has a reference, uh, has as a reference the political orders established with a state of rights. It is not a matter of the organization of new movements, of the responsibility of establishing for profoundly transformed political systems. For this reason, there is no reflection on the theme that the very in a Machiavelli clearly proposed, quote, moreover, to turn to those who by their own virtue and not by chance have become princes, I say that the most notable ones are Moses, Ciro, Romulus, uh, Theseus, and other similar ones. It was not a matter of giving counsel to an established who had an inherited traditional power. On the contrary, it was a revolutionary situation where a new order had to be established. And this is the, the theme of, of Machiavelli. He writes to a prince who is coming into a situation that's kind of chaotic and he doesn't have tradition on, on his side. He needs to rally the people and create something new. This is, this is what Machiavelli is talking about in The Prince. Machiavelli does not uh, situate himself in the institutional level B. For this purpose, he dedicated his work, Discourse on the First Decade of Titus Livius. In the strategic level A, and in the beginning moment of the creation of something without precedent, starting something new. In this moment of fight, antagonism, and the Latin American people situates itself in a fight against the effective powers of the center, neoliberal capitalism, and against the intrins intrinsic uh, oligarchies within each Latin American country. A dialogue is established of double complicity between leadership and the people. All right. I think, I think, I've done enough comment on that. Okay. Uh, but this dialogue uh, of double complicity between leadership, the populist leader, and the people who are being led by the leader. Quote, the people, seeing that it cannot resist the great ones, increase the reputation of one of them and makes her a prince in order to be under her authority protected. She attains the principality with popular favor, finds herself alone, and has around her very few or no one that are not ready to obey. Moreover, one cannot with honesty satisfy the great ones without injuring the others, but one could satisfy the people because the end of the people is more honest than that of the great, since the latter wants to oppress and the former to not be oppressed. Taking away from this text everything that is paternalistic and aristocratic, it is understood that leadership is invested of authority by the same people that need certain direction. The power comes from the people, but the people need direction. But at the same time, it imposes conditions of fidelity in the sense of what we have called ob obediential power on the fights of the people. The people create the myth of leadership. It needs it. It supports it. It 
directs it. And it can suffer a great disillusionment. The strategic postulate should strive for the dissolution of all leadership, of all avant-gardeism. A people that fully exercises a horizontal, self-referential, self autonomous, self-determining, participative democracy does not need but a weak leadership. However, in moments of great transformation, more so in revolutionary processes, the mutually enriched dialectic of leadership and people for itself is necessary. A dialectic that grows in the slow exercise of the symmetric participation of all its members. Democracy as the foundation of legitimacy above the state of rights. And he keeps on referring to the state of rights. That's just sort of liberal bourgeois uh, democracy, like the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution, and thinking that, you know, and when everybody's worried about their rights and, and trying to protect their rights and, and, and fight for their rights, uh, they aren't, uh, you know, that, that the, there's problems with that. And, and we see how there's a lot of contention in the United States over these sort of discussions of rights. What Dussel is suggesting is that that's a product of liberal bourgeois democracy that emphasizes rights so much as a way of managing the people, kind of in a divide and conquer way, um, we could say, if we're outside of Dussel. Um, but, uh, but what Dussel is suggesting is that if the people are organically more integrated into the democratic process, then they don't worry so much about rights. They're worried about actually having political power where they, uh, they get behind a strong leader when a strong leader is needed, like in a transformative moment or in a revolutionary, you know, real revolutionary moment. But as the situation changes, the people begin to reassert their power over leadership so that there is a symmetry between the people and the leader. But at times, there's an asymmetry where the leader really needs to lead. So it's a populism for moments of transformation. Uh, and, I, and then this kind of altered sort of form of populism that he's been suggesting at other times. But he, he is talking about a transformation that goes beyond liberal bourgeois politics, and that's what he sees as a problem in Latin America, is that the only conception of democracy is the state of right, this liberal bourgeois uh, democracy that ultimately ends up just dominating the people in a largely undemocratic way. This issue of the existence of leadership in popular political movements would have to be described first as a syllogism. A, the universality would be present in the in undivided political community still in the time of consensus, in the classic exercise of power of the historical block of political parties. Uh, B, the particular, particularity would consist in the people in the transformative act, even revolutionary in the social movement or in the base political community that would be the messianic movement of uh, W. Benjamin. And then C, the singularity exercised by the leadership, the Moses or Machiavelli, in dialectic function with the other moments. These moments mutually determine each other and complement one another, each uh, playing necessary political functions. Okay. Um, I don't think I want to go into describing the syllogism here. Um, okay, so, um, but we see this as a progress from uh, the standard political community dominated by political parties to the uh, sometimes referred to as an event in which the people actually take action in a kind of revolutionary moment. And then there's a, a singularity uh, where, you know, and he's, he's talking about syllogism in a metaphorical way here. And the singularity is when 
that revolutionary spirit is invested in a single person as leader to, to then carry the transformation forward in a strategic way. Okay, so effectively in history, peoples were never without leadership since the indicated and mythical figures of Moses in the exalted narrative of Aaron's block in the principle of hope. There has been no historic revolution without leadership uh, as the Bolivar, J. Du San Martin or M. Hidalgo in the first Latin American emancipation of the 19th century. Uh, Lenin in Russia, uh, in the Russian Revolution in October, Mao Zedong in China, Fidel Castro in Cuba, El Cardenas in Mexico, uh, the Sub Marcos in Chiapas, Evo Morales in Bolivia, etc. However, little or nothing has been mediated theoretically about this unavoidable practical political function. I think it is necessary to reflect on this topic. Okay, so that's interesting, is that um, is that uh, he is claiming that all, uh, all peoples at some point are led by charismatic leaders. And this is why he says you can't do away with populism. You know, this is what he, he's like, okay, populism can go wrong, but we can't do away with populism because it's just a fact of historical reality. Uh, so that's something to think about. And he says, I think it's something we need to reflect on. Okay, the dangers to avoid are the extremes. A, the avant-garde leadership in the right, authoritarian as Hitler and Mussolini, or in the left as the Central Committee, the democratic centralism and the dictatorship of the proletariat in the Soviet Union, the Central Committee of the Communist Party in, in Stalin's Soviet Union, or B, the spontaneous populism uh, criticized by F. Fanon, and now with a disparaging denomination which attributes to the people a strange omniscience on the basis of which it cannot make political mistakes. Uh, that whatever the people decide, whatever's popular is good. And, and of course, that's, that's not right. This is the question of, uh, you know, and, and so this last category, uh, the second category, spontaneous populism, is kind of like mob rule. And of course we see that like in the terror of the French uh, French Revolution in, in the 1790s, um, where it just went, went uh, totally wrong. Just because it's popular doesn't mean it's good. But we have this idea of democracy. Okay, so back to the original problem of populism. This is the question of the relation between theory and praxis, between the masses and the organic intellectuals, such as Gramsci enunciated, a question of great importance in the actuality of Latin America in the beginnings of the 21st century. Since the progressive center-left emerging governments, although not revolutionary in the classical sense, anti-neoliberalists but not anti-capitalists, have a visible leadership in the persons of in Kirchner, Tabari, Ignacio, Lula da Silva, Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales, Rafael Correa, Daniel Ortega, Colom, and many others. Okay, so um, now many of these people would be described by, like on Fox News or on, even on CNN. Um, they largely agree that many of these peoples listed here would be socialist and maybe even communist and left-wing radicals. But what Dussel is saying, you know, these are not, these are just center-left people. <laughs> They're just traditional democratic socialists. Uh, you know, they'd be considered middle of the road in, in Europe. Uh, it's just that the Washington consensus is so far to the right in this neoliberal direction. And the Democratic Party is a neoliberal uh, party. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton is kind of the poster child for neoliberalism uh, that that Dussel is consistently um, criticizing here, as is uh, Obama and uh, and Hillary Clinton and, and Joe Biden, uh, for that matter. I mean. Not, uh, 
as charismatic as the others, right? But uh, but uh, this is all. These are all. That's what's meant by neoliberalism, <clears throat> which is a relatively right wing uh, political agenda. And Dussel is saying, okay, but we have these people who are fighting back in Latin America, and this is kind of emerging, and there's some effectiveness of this happening in Nicaragua, Bolivia, Venezuela, but um, uh, uh, in, 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 in each of these instances, when there's a transformation actually happening, breaking away from the domination of of neoliberalism of the Washington consensus, uh, there's these leaders that emerge. And so again, this is like historical reality that he's pointing to. Um, all right, so, you know, we have to consider his, uh, his notion of populism uh, because of these historical facts. Okay, leadership is necessary in certain political junctures. In Chinese political philosophy, how say, Tung Si, from the 17th century, wrote a strategic work under the title Awaiting for the Dawn. It would be like Machiavelli's Prince, but in a completely different situation. In this case, the Chinese political philosopher equally awaits a strong leadership that could reorient a corrupt empire, which has over 150 million inhabitants uh, at that time. The works of the European philosophers of the same age will look like provincial reflections of uh, peripheric thinkers, right? Uh, Machiavelli's Prince is about, uh, you know, like a city of some hundred thousand uh, inhabitants. Uh, the Chinese Sung uh, Si is talking about, uh, you know, something on a much grander scale. Nevertheless, this leadership would not find support in the critical consensus of the people democratically, but it would descend from top to bottom, reorganize society like in the time of the originary three dynasties of China. Quote, in ancient times, everybody who was under the sky were considered. The lords and princes were like servants. The prince spent her life working for anybody who was under the sky. Now the prince is the master and all of those under the sky are her servants. This articulates precisely the sense of an obedient power, a power that operates through obedience of the people, as it, postulated, as it, it is postulated in the case of the just prince and of its corruption in the posterior tradition, the later tradition, but there's this originary beautiful prince. In every sense, the exercise of leadership was authoritarian, oligarchic, paternalistic. There were no, as it can be supposed, possible democratic demands. The people could not articulate its unmet needs as demands because it's a top-down authoritarian sort of government, even in the idealized past of the originary prince. On the contrary, it is a matter of correctly defining the importance and necessity of leadership in situations of profound political change, in certain cases revolutionary change. In these situations, the social movements and the popular masses could symbolically invest an aura on certain leaders, an aura built by the very people for its protection, demanding obedience from the consensus of movements and from the people, a consensus expressed in their democratic organizations upon which leadership is to be articulated. If the leadership becomes autonomous and pretends to identify its own will with the site of political power, one falls into profound corruption. If the leader remains faithful to the service of the people, providing unity of creative Activity, trust, patience, her function becomes necessary. Okay. Uh, maybe no virtue in Machiavelli's sense is more laudable in leadership than the firmness as the will's capacity of resisting the blow than the constancy of resistance with respect to duration. Lula 
uh, in Brazil, was defeated many times as candidate to the presidency. Andreas uh, Manuel Lopez Obrador in Mexico visits one by one the 2,500 municipalities after the fraud suffered in 2006. For decades, the San Marcos resists in the Chapagneca uh, jungle, the persecution on the part of the oligarchy and the military. These are leaderships that show democratically articulated in suffering, strategic intelligence and disciplined obedience, the fulfillment of the material requirements of the collective agent in a ultimate situation, the people in a state of rebellion. Okay, so these are examples from from Latin America of strong leaderships that have this virtue of firmness, uh, especially over the long run, just slogging through the difficulties. All right. And, and, and so, uh, and, and so Ducell here, you know, suggests that uh, through a perseverance and firmness of will, leaders can effectively lead on, a, on, a, on the basis of populism, but they have to actually be fulfilling the needs of the people so that uh, the, so that the people can uh, give the power to the leader. Okay. 